Hi everyone, welcome to the garden and it's a beautiful August evening here. It's seriously warm, somewhere around 27, 28 degrees at the minute, which is definitely hot enough for me, but it's the perfect opportunity to share with you a little walk around the garden, share with you some of the progress that I've made and also some of the incredible exotic plants with that low evening sunlight just cutting through the garden. It really is beautiful. Now, if you're new to my channel, I live in North Lincolnshire and I grow a huge range of exotic and tropical style plants. Plants with huge leaves, unusual foliage, massive exotic blooms. I grow a bit of everything, but the main theme of the garden, it's jungle. Now, the garden is around seven and a half meters wide by about 70 meters long, but that doesn't mean that I planted the whole lot up yet. We've only been here around two years now, and I've mainly focused on the middle section. If you've been watching my videos for quite a while, or you're a subscriber, you might have seen my fire pit project. Unfortunately, that's pretty much stalled where it was, more on that later. So today, I really want to focus on this main jungle area to show you some of the planting and hopefully give you a few tips and ideas for your gardens at home. So let's get started. Just before we do, one quick note. If you're expecting an immaculate garden packed full of hundreds of bedding plants, that's not my garden, that's not this video. In fact, last year, I made the decision to actually leave a lot of my plants in the ground for winter. A bit of a gamble, a bit of a risk, and you'll soon see whether it's paid off or not. I made that decision because this year I really wanted to focus on my projects, such as the fire pit area. Life's had other plans, but still, I think it's been really interesting to see what's thrived in the garden and how, in some respects, this tropical effect has actually been very low maintenance this year. So what I want to do is go through the different areas of the garden, show you the key plants, tell you about some care tips for them, show you the plants that you might not notice at first, but I think really tie the garden together. And as well, a few tips on how you can create this effect without loads of effort. It's actually surprising what you can grow without a lot of special care. So now, actually, let's get started. When I close my eyes, I see That's just a quick glimpse at some of the incredible exotic plants, the ones that I would recommend for UK gardens, and I'll also try and tell you where I got the key plants from. But as always, if there's anything you want to know, leave a comment on the video and I'll try to get back to every single one. Now, stick with this video because I've really got some exciting news to share with you very soon. Something that's definitely a bit of a game changer for the garden here. But before I begin the actual tour and showing you around the garden, I wanted to say about tropical gardening. I think people assume that it's always a massive challenge and that challenge is winter. Usually that's the case. It's usually a case of which plants can survive outside, which ones need a bit of care and which ones need full on care, bringing inside, moving into a greenhouse, that kind of thing. This winter, it hasn't been cold at all. We got down to around minus three, minus four. Yes, there was snow. We had a couple of snowfalls and growing an exotic garden, although you don't really like the snow, it definitely looks pretty falling down onto the tree ferns and the palms. We've had frost, we've had ice, but nothing severe this time around. And it wasn't really until Storm Eunice hit the garden that I had the first challenge this year. That wind really battled through the garden and it made a proper mess of some of the big leaf plants. But everything bounces back in time, these things happen. This year, probably the biggest challenge, and I can't believe I'm saying this here in North Lincolnshire, has actually been a complete lack of rainfall and also ridiculously high temperatures. Usual summer moans like last year are that it was really cloudy and that we get rain pretty much all the way through the summer holidays. This year it's been the opposite. We can't complain about the amount of sun we've had, but it's been an incredibly dry year. That dry spring has led to a dry summer. If you live in the UK, I don't really need to say anymore. It's really been serious. And in fact, locally, there's fields that have completely dried up. We've had a couple of field fires. One's actually set light to some houses and taken them out. If you drive around the countryside, you can see there's hedges that have crisped up and gone brown. There's even trees. It looks like autumn's come early. So it's definitely been serious and the temperatures that have brought that about have certainly been unprecedented. Here, usually around 30 degrees C, that's a hot summer day. We might see that maybe two or three times a year at tops really. But this year, about an hour down the road that way in Coningsby, 
it's been over 40 degrees C, which has been just really a staggering real challenge for the garden here. And a lot of the plants, you might assume, being tropical plants, they'd love it. Some of them have experienced challenges. So as I go around the garden today, I haven't tidied things up too much. This is definitely a bit of reality, really. You might have seen your garden made perfect. Today's video was pretty much my garden made real, really. So as we walk around, hopefully I can share with you some of the lessons that I've learned from this year and the changes that I might make going forwards. So I hope there's something in this video for everyone. Let me know in the comments if there's anything that you want to ask questions about or if you want to share your experiences with what's been quite a challenging but very sunny air. So let's get started with the garden tour for real. Starting off then, we're around 15 metres away from the house and in my jungle style border, which is opposite my future lean-to greenhouse location. And the main theme for this border, well, to be honest, there isn't really one. I'm having my lean-to greenhouse, I'm going to build that, we'll say it's a few years off now, opposite this border. So the general idea was to have all the cool jungle plants I really enjoy growing, really monstrous plants that grow really big and could definitely create that lush jungle atmosphere. I've got plants here like Tetrapanax, which grows massive leaves. Those plants can really tower over you and the leaves can get to over a metre and a half across. Next to that, we've got Berinda papyrifera, a blue bamboo that's certainly worth growing. And sharing the blue theme is this. This is a Trachyapis princeps. This is a new form hybrid. Essentially, it's a cold hardy palm that's got a beautiful sort of silvery blue hue to the undersides of the leaves. That's definitely a stunner. And pretty much, I've gone a little bit mad here, really. We've got another massive Tetrapanax there. At the front, we've got a Musa Baju banana, which by itself, they can get pretty big indeed. So really, I think the general theme here is lots of big, cool plants. There's no real strong design, and I've taken a few risks such as risk number one, the main risk. This, you can't really see the base there, but that's a Cyathea medullaris. It's a black Australian tree fern. And as you can see, it's really struggled. So this is a plant that you'd assume most of the struggles with actually relate to winter temperatures. Sure, it took a bit of foliage damage in winter, but it kept growing just fine in spring. And then what's happened this summer, after that 140 degree day, it's just completely toasted this side of it. And what I think's happened is, it's basically down to the wind. It was like having a hairdryer blowing in your face. The winds were really strong coming from that direction and they've pretty much toasted everything that wasn't actually sheltered. So here you can probably see the fronds that are protected under the Dixonia tree fern there. They're pretty much fine, but go down a bit further where there's strong winds that come through, through here, it's really just nipped them. The plant itself will be fine, it'll grow back it's already pushing some new fronds through. But I think it's interesting to see a plant from a much warmer place has still been affected by the temperatures. Another plant that's been affected, don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom in today's video, is this here. This is a Schaeffler Taiwaniana. And as you can see, the new foliage, it's been burnt to a crisp by that heat. But the plant is still pushing some new green leaves out. It'll look a bit messy this year, but I've got no doubt that it'll bounce back. And worst case with this plant, if it actually came to it, I could soon trim that main stem down somewhere around there and it will grow up to form multiple trunks and potential even more incredible down the line. So that's definitely something to think about. And when you look at the ground here, again, I said this piece of the garden, it's not highly designed. It's pretty much all about my main key plants. And here I've got a house plant, the Alocasia, that's Brisbaneensis, really easy to grow in summer and overwinters inside as a house plant. Just keep it ticking over, very little water, and it does just fine. And the plants actually tie it together. Firstly, you might have seen in previous videos, Salvia Amistad, a beautiful, easy plant, so incredibly easy to grow, but it gives so much back. And I've done a video all about it. Great for the pollinators, it flowers for months on end, really highly recommended. And the filler plants, as I call them, these are the plants I push into the ground around sort of mid-May time, and they just basically pop up and fill any gaps. Here, we've got nasturtiums, which I'm a big fan of. Sure, they get eaten a bit by caterpillars, but it really doesn't matter, because for around a pound something, you can get a pack of 60 seeds, and that's enough to fill the garden with. I just like the way they really spill over the edges. They've got such bright colours, and they definitely fit in with a tropical theme. So like last year's tour, I think the main key point of this bit is pretty much you can grow whatever plant you want. 
as long as it looks tropical or exotic to you, grow it in your garden. But as we're heading through, I want to show you an area that's definitely worked this year. And that would be this area here. Now, I'm a huge fan of jungle planting. And to me, this is an area of the garden, probably the main area that I planted and it just feels right straight away. So as you can see, it's mostly green and that's to really sort of contrast nicely with the warm orange of the brickwork. And as you can probably see looking around, you might see some weeds, but we'll just ignore them for the purpose of this video. There, you've got European ginger, got Mahonia soft caress there. We've got ferns and then probably the key underrated plant of this section over there is Hakanakloa. Hakanakloa macra, that's Japanese forest grass. If you've got a shady spot and you want something with a really sort of soft texture that can flow over the edges of the borders, I'd highly recommend that. It's such an easy plant to grow. It's a grass that doesn't need to be in full sun. In fact, it prefers this kind of shady area. And I think it just looks great with all the big leaves. And together, they really combine to create a beautiful sort of mix of different foliage types. That's what I like best about this area. And I think probably the other key thing, unlike the area that I've just showed you with all the big plants battling against each other, in this border, I think the reason it works is firstly, the simplicity. Lots of greens, there might be lots of different leaf shapes, but they've all shown that same green theme. And secondly, there's a good bit of balance to the border. So as you can see, there's the grasses, the ferns, the Asarum European there, they stay relatively small. Then we've got a sort of mid canopy. We're here we've got Fatsia polycarpa that's still sizing up. We've got Terris umbrosa, which is an incredible fern over there. And then pushing through, we've got the bigger plants. Plants like this one here. This is Scheffler schwelliensis, which is always a bit of a mouthful to say. I got this one from Pan Global Plants. It's actually a double trunker, as you can see there. And I think it has to be one of the most graceful plants in the garden. I know it's very similar to Taiwaniana, and I suspect there might be a little bit of a sort of rejuggling of the naming at some point, but I think this is really one of the star Schefflerys in the garden. As you can see, it's been untouched by this hot weather. It's also been untouched by winter as well. And a plant like this, it looks like an exotic house plant now, but it stays outside all year, and this is gonna grow up and up and up and form a beautiful exotic canopy. And in fact, let's mention the word canopy, looking further up, this area is all about the tree ferns. So as you can see looking around, we've got Dixonia Antarctica. Those are definitely the key plants in this area. I just love the way that that sunlight you can see there just shines through the fronds. For me, this part of the garden, it's as much about the light as it is the plants. You come through this sort of narrow, restricted, dark passageway, you push past the bamboo, and then you go out into the bright sun. It's a real contrast. And having a little sort of restricted area like this, especially in a longer garden, it really breaks it down. It creates a bit of suspense and a bit of excitement. I really like this area. On the left hand side, you'll see another incredible plant for exotic gardens. This is Xanthodicia, and whether you go for White Giant or Hercules, you're getting a massive leaf plant, and here I think it looks fantastic. Contrasting against the finer fronds of the Dixonia Antarctica, another Terrace Umbrosa over there, I think those big glossy leaves, they really break things up, and they definitely give the jungle that real exotic vibe. And behind it, you'll see another really striking plant. This is a blue bamboo, it's a Berinda, not maybe the toughest bamboo. I think really it's just good luck that it actually towers over the path there. It really creates a sort of archway into the garden. The relaxing green hues of Dixonia Antarctica definitely makes it one of my favorite exotic plants. And the look of those fronds, it's certainly similar to a lot of the ground ferns like Dryopteris that I grow here. They really help tie the whole garden together. But this is a plant with very unusual foliage. This is a Shudapanax. This particular one is Trifoliatus. And as you can see, it's got the most incredibly bizarre leaves. It's definitely a very unusual plant. And I like to have a few weird and wonderful plants like this dotted through the garden to really give it that sense of a proper full on exotic jungle. I think it's really quirky, but I love it. And over here is another foliage plant that I want to share with you. This is another Trachycarpus and it's a new form princeps again. I just think the light as it hits those leaves, they've almost got a silvery blue color underneath. It really is incredible. That one is the one I actually moved from our old garden and it's already settling in well. And this heat is really pushing the new leaves out, which is great to see. But anyway, 
on from these plants, we're moving on from greens to a world full of big leaves, bright colors, and amazing flowers. We're about to enter the jungle clearing. We're now in one of my favorite areas of the garden when subtlety and a plain color scheme, they go out the window, replaced instead with huge bold plants, all kinds of different colors. It's really all about the big leaves and they don't come any bigger than my Gunner and Manicata. I won't go on about it too much because I've mentioned it in so many videos before, but it's seriously one of my all time favorite plants. Massive leaves over a meter and a half across, this year, it suffered a bit, as you'll see. Some of the lower leaves have definitely browned off more than they would usually. And it's a plant that it loves water. So this year has definitely been a challenge for it. And I've been careful not to really spoil it. I've not kept pouring and pouring the water on because to a certain extent, plants have to sort of get by. Some years they're gonna do better than others. And a lot of the time, it's the work you do in winter that sets them up for the summer. Often when it comes to planting, choosing the right spot, it really sets up a plant for long-term success. And doing things like mulching in winter, it really reduces the summer water requirements. So that is one of the crucial care tips that I credit a lot of the success in this area to. The Gunner Manicata, yes, I've watered it a couple of times a week, but it's done all right despite that. And the other big leaf plant here, the one you'll see next, is the Anseti Vegicosa Morellii. Those huge red Abyssinian bananas, Honestly, what a plant. When you see it with that sun pouring through, the leaves just look incredible. With every shade of green, purple, red, and orange in them, it's seriously one of the jewels of the garden here. Now, let me show you around a bit more. As you're walking past the silvery blue princeps then, the first plant that hits you is this. This is actually a Ligularia, which is a water-loving plant, which is one reason why, like the Gunnera, it's definitely struggled a bit. Potentially, there isn't enough water or enough moisture in the soil in this area, but every year it still throws up these amazing yellow flowers. It definitely deserves its space. But if you thought these flowers were exotic, then you'll love this. This is a Hedicium coccinium ginger. I just think hardy gingers, they're one of the most elegant, exotic flowers that you can grow here in the UK. They are relatively hardy. Again, if you give them a good mulch, they can get through most winters. Or alternatively, you can dig them up keep them inside a greenhouse or polytunnel, keep them frost free just about, and that way you get a head start in spring. But whatever you do, it's worth it for these amazing flowers. You might find that they can flower a little bit later in the season, usually around September time. And I suppose you can hurry them up by giving them a nice sunny spot, good rich soil, plenty of feed, plenty of water during summer. But whenever they decide to show the flowers, they're just absolutely worth it. Seriously, one of the most incredible plants you can grow here. But as we pass that, you'll see the first of my insetti. And this one, I grow here mainly for the morning light. As the light hits those leaves in the morning, just dappling through them, it looks really incredible. And for me, that purple color, it absolutely sets off the other Salvia Amistad down here. It's the perfect pairing, one that I grew last year, this time I've added in the Persian Shield over there for even more metallic purple hues. I just love all the rich colors combined together. Maybe not tasteful, but here, oranges, purples, reds, yellows, they all play together and create a lovely little area of exotic planting. But as we spin around, you'll see even bigger leaves. This is the Gunnera, and whilst it's not in perfect condition this year, I think it's grown really well. In fact, you can barely see an eight foot tree fern behind it there, which is pretty incredible really. But more on that in just a little bit. Let's spin round and show you the full vista. And as you can see, we've got more gingers here. They're Hedicium gardnerianum. I grow those in pots every single year. And that way I can just move these giant blocks of foliage. They get a better head start in spring. And in late summer, early autumn, when those flowers come through, what a sight and what a scent, really are incredible. Another Rensetti there, 
that one is positioned for the evening sun. But before we go down that direction, I want to show you a bit more about this area here. As I stand here, you can probably guess behind me a couple of my standout plants. You've got another Rensetti here with that palm leaf, the shadow, just looking incredible there with the evening sun behind it. And over on this side, you've got Canna Musifolia, a truly monstrous canna. Again, I've done a video all about it. Last of canna, they can get over three meters tall. Not grown for the flowers, but instead the incredible foliage. It genuinely does look like a banana plant and it does all that in a single summer season. Seriously incredible. Even in pots, it's over two and a half meters tall. So that really is saying something. And we're only in August. So they've got at least two months of growing left ahead of them. But the main plant for this area, well, you might recall in spring, I had two projects. I had my main fire pit project, which like I said, has slightly stalled. And here, I actually won about a year and a half ago, a greenhouse. Unfortunately, I haven't received that yet. Speaking with the company, they were gonna send out quite a small greenhouse, which is gonna to go to the back of this area here. That'll show you in just a couple of seconds. And in front of it, I was gonna have a seating area. Now, I've not heard back from the greenhouse company yet. So my plans for this area, they're definitely not 100% concrete yet. So I've sort of used it as a bit of a holding area, really. Somewhere to store all the plants I'm gonna have around the fire pit. Some of them are unusual plants. So I just want to give you a quick sort of whiz around the area now and point out some of the key plants that I'll be growing at that far end of the garden, the real sun trap that is the fire pit. You'll see the planting is a little bit more Mediterranean style exotic. This is the area that I planted up earlier in spring. And currently from this view, it's quite overgrown. We've got a massive Phoenix canariensis there, which has grown really well. And speaking of growing well, you've got my Virginia creeper growing up the side of the brick shed there. That's Parthenocystis henriana. Hopefully that'll have lovely autumn color. And that bamboo pushing up through the canopy there, that is another Berinda papyrifera, the blue bamboo. That again is sized up incredibly well. But the main focus of this area here is pretty much just storage at the minute. So as you can see, we've got all the unusual plants from our fire pit. These are fascicularia and they're actually a bromeliad related to pineapples. You can actually see there that amazing scarlet colouring and in the centre there, a beautiful sort of bluey purple flower. They really are bizarre looking plants and something that I'm going to spread throughout the fire pit area. Along with other plants like the red hot pokers, euphorbia there, some interesting sedums. And looking further back, I've got some yucca rostrata ready to go in the ground and a few of my potted plants, including some colocasia, some unusual palms. That's a project for next spring. And again, I'll show you those amazing canna folia. What a big plant. For something that you can overwinter as a tuber, keep very easily in a greenhouse or polytunnel over winter, you get a lot of foliage for your money. Spinning round, I've got the exotics, a cycad there, a very rare Hello Hercules there, unusual palm there, but more on that in another video very soon. And then we move over to my actual area of planting. So just having a quick look through, for me, the star plant, it's got to be the Hedicium gingers. They're just such a striking plant. I love the foliage, the sort of glossy sheen it's got in the evening sun. And then when the flowers come, it really makes it complete. But let's push through and show you a bit more of the jungle clearing. Just before we head through, one of the reasons why projects have been a little bit delayed this year has actually presented himself. It's Remy, the new addition to our family and a little brother for Max. I say little brother, he's actually quite a bit bigger than Max. He's definitely a puppy that's full of character, incredibly boisterous, very naughty, aren't you? He literally nibbles anything. Not plants luckily, but if there's any sort of twigs around, any broken pots is all over them. And I've got to say that we knew having a second dog was gonna be tricky. A lot of time people actually say that having a second one, it doesn't mean it's twice the effort, it's more like five times the effort. So we went into it knowing that, but it's really taken a while because he's just so boisterous. And when they run up and down, they just charge around the garden. So it's definitely been a case of having to babysit them, be a bit of a referee at times, but we absolutely wouldn't change any of it. Now they do mostly get on, but definitely uh, got a sort of brother relationship in that they're always running around and badging into each other. But it's certainly taken a lot of time this summer. That is reason number one. Remy's gone running off now, so I've just picked up Max. And after holding Remy, you realize just how small Max is. 
boring obviously they're both miniature dachshunds he really is an incredibly tiny one but he's certainly again full of character maybe a little bit more chilled out now when we first got him or maybe remy really is just full-on crazy so it makes max seem a bit more chilled but either way they've both been definitely full-on but a great addition to our home this year on about additions there's something else you need to know about this year some really exciting news to share with you at the end of November, we're expecting our first baby. We're expecting a girl, which really is something that I'm looking forward to. Obviously, it's gonna mean some changes, and I don't know how the garden progress will go next year. We'll see. Maybe the garden will become even more a sanctuary for me, somewhere to escape to. I know a lot of people say that having a baby means you sleep better, you get infinitely more energy, disposable income just pours in. So I'm sure everything will be absolutely fine and the garden will continue as usual. But seriously, joking aside, I still want to continue with this YouTube channel with the garden. Both things really give me a lot of pleasure. They take a lot of work, but they definitely give a lot back to me. And on the sort of theme of YouTube channels, you might be aware that a YouTube channel actually generates some income. Obviously, when you consider the amount of time it takes, it's nowhere near a minimum wage. And that's before you look at the music licensing, having the video editing software, actually buying all the cameras and everything, as well as the insurances, paying tax, all that sort of boring stuff. But a YouTube channel does generate a bit of the money at the end of the month. So it's certainly something that I want to build and develop. And if you're a fan of my channel, of my videos, doing things like giving a video a thumbs up, it takes a split second. You can even do it on your TV. Just, I think, press the up button and you'll see it there. Any video that you like or take the time to leave a comment on, YouTube think that's a good video and it shares it with more people then. So doing a little thing like that or sharing my videos to any groups that you're members of, people who might enjoy my garden, it honestly helps. Every subscriber, every like, every comment, it really is appreciated and it helps support the channel and hopefully makes it something where I can keep bringing a bit of money in and invest it into the channel and making bigger and better videos. That's something I'm really looking forward to. But anyway, on with the jungle clearing. Getting a jungle effect here in the UK then, it's all about big leaves and dense planting, over planting even. And here in the garden, you can see, I've got the gunner on the left, the hedicium ginger there. Those are actually in pots, so I can move around these blocks of foliage. And here I've used them to sort of fill this area up, give a bit more volume. But as we walk through, you can see the gunner has seen some damage. I could have chopped those off, but I decided not to, so you can sort of see the real effects of the heat in the garden. The plant itself will be just fine, and most of the leaves are pretty much untouched. As you spin around, you'll see I've got more banana plants in pots. Again, those, I actually use them to have some more foliage dotted through the garden to really create the feeling of a lush sort of jungle forest environment. And again, you'll notice that heavy backdrop of greens. We've got ferns, persicaria, a few colourful coleus dotted around to break things up, a hardy begonia there. And a lot of these cannas, they're actually seed grown plants and plants that are left in the ground last winter. So that was a gamble that's paid off. They've pretty much all come back. And as we head further up the garden, you'll see one in flower. Got some lovely plants in here. Schefflera macrophylla at the back there with its really big, bold leaves. As we head through, you'll see a lot of the sort of filler plants here, the persicaria, again, the nasturtiums. That one's escaped the border there. But they're really all dwarfed by the massive insetti. Just seriously, what a plant. It really is one of my favourites. I just love the way that this sun just paints pitch on the back there. I can take some really nice pictures of this plant without even trying. It really is beautiful. That's a water bowl there for the birds. We actually get so much wildlife here in the garden. And I think it's partly down to the planting and partly down to the habitat that we've actually created here. We're lucky enough to live on the edge of a village. So naturally, there's a lot of bats, there's a lot of bird life. But I think next door, having those big trees and here, we've just got so many different environments for the birds to play around in. You come out here on a spring day, probably not with these two, but you come out on a spring day and there's so many baby birds hopping around, jumping all over the plants. And I think it's just such a diverse range of habitats. When you think of sort of wildlife gardening, it's easy just to assume that you have to grow purely native plants and have a very sort of overgrown planting scheme. Well, admittedly, this is overgrown planting, but it's mostly exotic plants. That being said, there's still flowers for the pollinators. 
there's still water for the birds to drink and there's still plenty of places for creatures and other birds to inhabit. I think really having a wildlife garden or any kind of garden full of actual life, it's not so much about the plants themselves, but about the way you garden. It's about using mulches rather than pouring on loads of fertilizer. It's about not using pesticides because ultimately every plant has got minor imperfections. Every plant's got bites taken out of it, but you learn to overlook them, see the bigger picture. Like this scene here, when I show you this, it probably looks packed full of huge exotics, really interesting foliage. But if you zone in, you'll see there's bits of damage everywhere. I think really one thing that I've actually learned the past couple of years is to overlook the small things. It's all about the bigger picture. And if you follow a generally sort of organic principle, using mulches to build up the soil and not using pesticides, putting up with a bit of damage like this here, for the bigger picture, for a garden that's full of healthy plants, resilient plants, as well as life, it's really worth it. There you'll see my small wildlife pond is completely surrounded with foliage. Don't know what Remy's doing there, but at the minute is not obviously being naughty. Matter of time. So you'll see heading through, this area is completely overgrown, but in quite a controlled way, I should say. The Persicaria, a great filler plant. I've got a mixture of Purple Fancy and Red Dragon, and they're both such a great plant. Very easy to grow, very tough, very hardy, and they just fill a spot so well. They tie in so nicely with their exotics. Here, we've got my Butea Aerius Partha, or Aerius Patha. Very tough, very hardy, and that one seems to actually enjoy our UK climate. As we head through, you'll see this is my bamboo tunnel. Now, the long-term plan for this area of the garden is actually to have the bamboo either side of the path. On this right-hand side, I've got this really tall vivax. This is Phyllostachys vivax auricolis, a really big bamboo. And this one is a runner, so it will need containing. On the left-hand side, I've actually got a load of clumping bamboos, some Phagesia robusta campbell at this end, and actually in the middle, you probably can't see it from this angle here, I've got a load of blue bamboos. I think what this area of the garden actually shows is that growing a tropical style garden, it's not all about the permanent plants. And it's actually a style of gardening that gives you more freedom for creativity, experimentation, as well as just changing your mind every year. So here, I've got the bamboos. And while they're actually filling out, eventually they will come to around the edge of this path here, I've planted loads of filler plants. So to me, a filler plant is something that it's not gonna stay there for years and years. Here, we've got the dahlia, they're just coming through now. So I've probably done this garden tour a few days too early. That's my Bohemian Spartacus, which is a really interesting dahlia, that very unusual flowers. And on this side, we've got my cannas. These are the ones that grew from seed and I actually left these in the ground last winter. And thanks to no late frost this year, They've all come up on time. They've all started growing away very well. They're not flowering just yet, but if I squeeze past here, you'll see all the weeds down there, just ignore them. And I look back, you can see there is one flowering. It's a Canna altensteinii that have grown from seed. And those, they're flowering at around six and a half, seven foot tall. Here, I've got it paired with Verbena benariensis. And again, personally, I think that's a reminder that you can grow whatever you want in your tropical style garden. For me, it's about big, bold, punchy colours. They don't always have to be truly tropical plants. And some more sort of standard garden favourites, like this verbena, they're going perfectly. I've used this not only to attract the wildlife, which it does perfectly, but also to really help to give some height to the garden. While I'm waiting for the bamboos to size up, that definitely gives it the volume. And in fact, this year, it's probably given a bit too much volume to the garden because now I could hardly get my wheelbarrow through. So yeah, I've definitely created that problem myself. But as we head through again, you'll notice that we're passing from another area of restriction, which is something that I've repeated in the garden. Just ignore Remy doing what Remy does and biting the plastic pot. Oh dear. We head through, the garden opens up again. Now, in the distance you'll see my builder's yard there and behind that, the fire pit project. I'll save that part of the garden for a day when I've got more progress and less weeds, definitely. So today, we'll just look at this section here and Remy will lead the way. 
Now, this is a part of the garden that I've struggled with. And the reason is, although it's shaded and relatively sheltered, in the winter, that wind comes absolutely just racing through from that angle there. It's really funneled through by that garage and the trees behind. So the plants get battered. So it's not the best spot for this quite slender Trachycarpus nova. Those leaves get very easily damaged. And in summer, the problem is, despite it being shaded, I think the big trees just suck so much moisture out the soil that a lot of the big leaf tropicals this year are actually struggling. So I think this year, or next year should I say, I'm gonna completely redesign this area and move some plants around. And for me, that's one of the best things about tropical style gardening. All these plants, especially plants like the cannas and the other bulbs, tubers and rhizomes, you can dig them up and move them around so easily. And in fact, it actually helps the plants. You can divide them, multiply them, give them a new lease of life. So next year, one of my plans, and I know saying this, knowing it probably won't happen, is to really give this area a bit more sort of structure that actually goes with the flow. Plants that can survive here in winter or potentially thrive here in summer. You're never gonna get every area planted right first time. I think it's easy to see these sort of Chelsea gardens and gardens designed on TV. They're done to look great at the time of filming or at the time of the show. But having a garden that works great year after year, having plants that can develop into the full sizes and just look right together, that's something that takes a bit of working out and definitely different evolutions over time. We've got some big bamboos there, they've grown well. We've got my Spectabilis and over there, that one's Phyllostachys auris sulcata auricolis with its amazing sort of golden culms. At the minute they're a bit bushy, but those will be real showstoppers when they size up. Now obviously we're a mess down here, but the border on the right hand side has definitely got a few things that I can talk about. So the predominant or the main plant in this border are the Jubea chilensis, the Chilean wine palms, which are without doubt my favorite cold hardy palm. And here I've got them in this sort of Mediterranean area. So I've basically used a sort of sandy mulch on the soil and some big rocks interspersed with a selection of succulents. Here, I've got some aeoniums that snake over that rock there. More aeoniums there. I've got some euphorbias, fascicularias, some grasses. And the general theme of this area is the planting's a little bit more sparse, a little bit more jungle sort of meets Mediterranean desert, if that can be a thing. The biggest plant you'll notice here is an echium in the middle. And that one, believe it or not, is actually one plant with a huge, great big trunk on it, if you can see down there. Probably not. There actually were two more heads on that plant, but the recent hot weather actually just, or the wind just completely blew them off. But I'm really interested to see how that plant develops next year. There are a couple of issues with this area. Firstly, this plant here. Now this, as you'll notice, you might be aware, it's a hylotelephium, or what used to be called sedum, and they've got too big. This is an example of a filler plant that's filled a little bit too well, and they've started to spill over and push onto the agaves. So that's the plant that looked great in the first year, but definitely will need some moving around. And I think what I might do, now my other palms, like that shamrops there have filled out, is completely remove those next year. But that's part of the process of evolving your garden. It's seeing things that looked great last year, great in September with all the insects buzzing over it, but now it's got a little bit too big. But with plants like these, you can see there, it's got a good clumpy base to it. You can dig that up, split it into three or four. You've got more plants and each of them will grow away just fine next year. So you're not hurting plants like that. And I think you've got to experiment with things. You've got to play around and not be afraid to get in there with a spade or shovel and move your garden around every single year to get the effect you want in. And when it comes to effect, having this raised border, it really sets off the Jubea. That looks fantastic there. The Echium raised up, it really does look a sight, but this strip chunk trachycarpus, it's actually struggled with a lack of moisture being raised up a bit and then also having those winds hitting it. It's definitely taken a while to settle in. So that's something that probably doesn't need raising up and might need a bit of additional water as a result. But you know, these are the lessons that you learn along the way. And the plants are tough, they'll survive. They just need a little bit of extra care and the right spot in the first place. But walking through, you can see my gav is there sizing up nicely. The metal one's still the same size. Here, Remy in the background. 
you can probably see there another example that agave has almost been completely covered over by that hylotelephium so they're definitely going to come out next year and i think this area will look all the better for having the planting being a little bit sparser and a little bit more focused on these bold architectural shapes now when it comes to plants overgrowing the spaces this euphorbia is one that you really need to give the space for this is euphorbia john phillips and it might look a bit rough at the minute because I've just cut the flowers off, but this is a plant that looks incredible even in winter. I think for me, it's a great plant that helps that transition between jungle and the more desert style planting. It looks great all the way through the year, very tough, very hardy. The flowers have got an incredible honey scent to them, and it's seriously something that I wouldn't be without in the garden. And behind it, we've got another example of a plant that's grown really well. This is Pinus patchula the Mexican weeping pine. And bear in mind, we've only been here two years. This was planted out in a relatively small pot. It's certainly a fast growing tree. Now you might think what's a pine or indeed any conifer doing in a tropical style garden, but I think the prehistoric foliage, it certainly fits in. I think they fit in well with the other sort of feather palms. The foliage ties in nicely together. And if you go to other exotic style gardens like RHS Wisley, They've got some Pinus patchula there. I know Matthew Pottage is a big fan of his unusual conifers. If you go to Great Dixter, their exotic garden, it's got a hardy backbone of these structural conifers. And to me, they're definitely unusual foliage, and I use them not just as a visual thing, but also for the protection they offer. A big tree like this, sure, it uses some of the sunlight from the other plants. It's gonna use plenty of water, but it's also going to help drain the soil in winter. It's going to take up the moisture that the plants like the agaves and palms they don't need. It's going to help slow down the wind as it rattles through the garden. And part of my long-term plan here is for trees like this Pinus patchula, my other eucalyptus, to actually form a bit of a windbreak, a shelter to stop the winds just surging down the garden from this way, because that's what tends to happen. And it's not just the wind, it's also the cold and the frost. Having a big plant like this especially evergreen ones over your other plants like these agaves here it definitely helps to take a bit of the frost off them and raise the temperatures just a fraction it's only a fraction but every little bit helps and i think as one last point as we walk around this area to me it's a great example or an example at least of having tall plants in a garden i think really if you want to create a jungle garden you can't just have a row of little plants at the edge of a garden it's all about having plants that push into your space. Not every part of the garden has to be restricted. It's nice to have some open areas, but having tall plants like the big palms, like the trees, like the bamboos and huge grasses, they instantly make you feel like you're part of a place. That's something that I looked at in my feature on Different Fernand, a beautiful garden with loads of exotics in Wales. And again, at Picton Castle Gardens, I think the trees there, they really add to the garden. And again, I suppose, Wisley, that garden is a fantastic example. The eucalyptus trees there, the amazing conifers, they certainly add to the exotic jungle atmosphere. So that's it for today's garden tour, or at least as much as I can film in one evening before, as you can probably tell, the sun's gone down and it's started to get a little bit dark. But it really has been a beautiful evening to be out here. And as you can see, the garden's not perfect. But eventually, I've decided that I'm okay with sharing that because for every bit of the garden that's not right, there's something to be learned. Not necessarily for you, but for me. I think when it comes to design, there's parts of the garden, like the shady bit near the brick shed with my chef Louis Schwelliensis, just like saying that. Those bits just look great first time round. Everything's in the right spot. I like the simple color scheme, I'm happy with it. And there's areas like the bit next to the shed with the palms that have been battered by the wind. That bit, I need to fully redesign it. But most parts of the garden, they sort of fall somewhere into the middle, where I'm happy with the main structural planting, the theme of the area, but it's more the filler plants that need adding, tweaking, or editing. Some of them have really struggled in the spots, like the ligularia, it hasn't had enough moisture. Others, like some of the euphorbias or the hylotelephiums at the far end, they've grown a bit too well. They've outgrown their spot, and potentially now they need removing to really show off the other plants. But ultimately, that's why I grow these filler plants. They help give that pack look pretty quickly and you're not worried about actually removing them, dividing them, chopping them up, spreading them around. That's not a problem. So that's something that I really want to continue to develop every single year with this garden. 
I think the crucial thing is a garden's not just a fixed static thing. It's not just a display. It's something that evolves every single year. And I know it's a bit of a cliche, but for me, it really is about the journey rather than the destination. And that's something I'm enjoying here with every passing month. If you want a few practical tips, firstly, I would say in this sort of time of challenging temperatures of potentially extreme weather events that are gonna become more common in future, sticking to the idea of right plant, right place is a mantra that's more true than ever. And even in the garden with exotics from all around the world, actually looking into a plant, finding out what rough kind of conditions it likes and choosing a relatively sensible spot in your garden, not just for how big it gets, but somewhere it's gonna be quite happy for most of the year, that's certainly crucial. My gunnera has got some damage and that's a plant that's grown under the shade of this tree in quite a damp spot or what would be quite a damp spot. If you have that gunnera in a raised bed with sandy soil, it would have no chance this summer, or at least to keep it happy would take a lot of resources, a lot of time, and it would never look as good as it could do. So to me, that's a crucial thing and a way of getting your plants through these challenging conditions. Secondly, I say the importance of mulching. I rarely fed the garden this summer. I can do videos about how plants should be fed, how much you should give them and at what intervals, but myself, we'll say I'm efficient more than lazy. I don't feed my plants that much fertilizer. The thing that gets them through is those applications of organic matter, soil conditioner, horse manure in winter. Those help to add food to the soil and they also help to lock in moisture. So it's really a win-win, something that I'll probably do a video about every single year <laughs> until more of you do that. It simply is the best single thing you can do for your garden. And thirdly, I think one crucial thing is, I know I can give practical care tips and things like that all day long, but having a tropical style garden, it's something for you, whatever ability of gardener you are. If you're new to growing plants, if you've come from doing things inside your house to suddenly I can do something with this outdoor area, or if you've been growing vegetables and flowers for years and years, having a tropical style garden, it can cater to any kind of ability, any kind of experience. And it's about not being afraid. A lot of these plants, they might look really sort of challenging. You might assume they're very high maintenance, but as you can see from my canners, all these leaves behind me here were from one packet of seeds and those have been left in the ground all winter. So they pretty much had no care whatsoever. I just keep them well watered and that's what you get from it. And the best thing is the flowers, they're still to come. So in another month's time, I'll probably do another little look around the garden. You'll see even more exotic flowers. So really don't be afraid to go for it. Try some unusual plants, try some exotic plants and don't be afraid to move things around every year if it's not quite right. Most plants are very tough, very adaptable. And with all these cannas and dahlias, they actually appreciate being dug up, split up every few years. So honestly, there's nothing but wins from it. So I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you've got any comments, leave them below. If you enjoyed this and want to see more of the garden over the coming months, then definitely subscribe to our channel. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. When we wake, hear the birds and see the sun. Side by side our fears are done All the good times just begun Oh, we know what we have, let's hold on tight Found what we're looking for in life Call us crazy, but things are finally right With you and I, the future is